This video is sponsored by Incogni. Hi, I'm Matt, and today I'm trying biomedical science. It seems so often that big science is hidden behind closed doors unless you know where to look. And oh, do we know where to look? I am at the Francis Crick Institute, one of Europe's biggest biomedical research centers, and they're going to show me some of the amazing things that they get up to. I am with Emily, and what is this place? What, what is the Francis <laughs> Crick? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, firstly, welcome. We are at the Francis Crick Institute. We're the largest biomedical research institute under one roof in Europe, mm -hmm. and we're all about discovery science. So, kind of working on fundamental biology, answering big questions, kind of discovering how things tick. And am I right in thinking that uh, Francis Crick was one of the four people who were instrumental in researching DNA right at the beginning? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so we're named after Crick because of this idea of a big discovery. So really pushing the envelope and finding out new things, which is what we're all about. So you're inside Hello Brain, um, and it's all about the cutting edge neuroscience that's happening here at okay, the Crick. Then. So we've got lots of very interesting and different things showcasing all the work that our scientists are doing. This is a human brain, and this is actually Rauri, who is one of our scientists here at the Crick. How do you? <laughs> get the, the, the picture of his brain to model it in 3D? My understanding is it was quite hard. This is a crocodile's brain, and but, it's to scale. <laughs> but crocodiles are so, so big, it's only got enough space for like snap and swim and yeah. nothing else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fruit flies, they're attracted to certain smells. So we've got lots of research going on at the Crick as to why this is. So each of these socks has a different smell in them. They smell? Yeah, they smell. So if you give it a sniff... Oh yeah, that one smells quite yeah. woody. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's open to Of all the things I could have thought I would be, be doing, doing today, it wouldn't be yeah, sniffing... Uh, sniff, sniffing sacks. <laughs> yeah, sniffing smell socks. So have they made these smell like fly as well? I don't think so, but that would have been a good I idea. I don't know what fly yeah. smells what, what like. Do, what do they smell like? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question to ask upstairs. Before I go to the lab, here's a question. Did you know that your personal information could be collected by companies and then sold to other companies without you even knowing about it? These data brokers could be aggregating things like your name, address, and online activity. And you could have agreed to this when accepting the terms and conditions and privacy policy of any service. The good news though, is you have the right to protect your privacy. You can request that these data brokers remove all the information they hold about you. But to do this would involve sending individual requests to the hundreds of companies that could be holding this information. Incogni, this video's sponsor, has a solution for this though, and it's all automated. You tell them whose personal information they'll be removing, and then give them permission to act on your behalf. Then they'll go through all of the data brokers that they know of and request that your information is removed without you having to do anything else. If this sounds like something you're interested in, then go to incogni.com slash Matt Gray and enter code Matt Gray for 60% off an annual plan. And of course, the link is in the description below. Having reached my sock sniffing quota for the day, I was allowed past the public exhibition to what I think might be my dream lab. The Making, the making Lab. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm Hello. Fill the lab coat up because I'm in a lab. Thank you. <laughs> So, I believe this is the Making Lab. Yes, this is the Making Lab. This is Christina. She's one of the team that works in the Making Lab here at the Crick as a senior LRS. Lab research scientist, sorry. Uh. A lot of acronyms in, uh, in research, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this is Alban. She's the head of the Making Lab. So all of this is your problem. <laughs> Um, <laughs> your joy. <laughs> My playground. Yes, that's a great way of saying it. So what do you even do in here? I can see 3D printers. So here we create systems, tools that don't exist yet for experiments. Okay. So scientists come to us when they need a tool to perform mm. an experiment and we make them with them bespoke just specifically for that kind of experiment. I just want to pause here because is this the coolest job ever? It is Alban and Christina's entire job to play with sciencey toys like 3D printers, to make things that don't exist, exist, so they can be used in some of the most cutting edge research in the entire world. 
and that's what I'll be having a go at today. We use normal printers, but we yep. also use bioprinters. Bioprinters? Uh, it's based on the same process as classic extrusion. So uh, a, a normal 3D printer works like kind of like a glue gun, where you've got some plastic that it's putting out in a line, you keep going over the yeah. top of it. Is this that Replace kind of... Replace the glue by cells. And you're going to have your in vitro cells, models. Cells in a soft gel material, so maybe gelatin or alginate or so something it's, it's, like that. So it is extruding a soft gel that has actual living yeah. cells in it. And yeah. you organize them in a way that they can develop the way they should in yeah. a normal environment, which would be in vivo. But we're trying to do it in vitro, uh, so in tiny uh, yeah. wells. What does that even get used for? Eventually, the aim is that we can do more and more experiments in these 3D constructed systems yeah. that currently we only can do in animal systems because that is a whole body. Um, so it's to try and reduce the need for animals in research, among other reasons. Yeah. And I suppose even if the parts are really, really tiny, you are 3D printing body parts at this point, just really teeny, teeny, tiny parts of the body. Yeah, we're... Cell parts. Yeah. So teeny, tiny. Yeah. yeah. At the micron moment, parts. we're mostly printing cells in particular patterns, and then they will actually usually self-organize to form a top, you know, a epithelial layer, uh, maybe a vascular layer for blood vessels, muscle layer, depending on the cell so types. So you suggest you put to them where they should be, yeah. and then they go organize to where they take would the, be. they'll take the the uh, factors that you add, so yeah. the triggers and the 3D shape, the inputs they get from the 3D shape, um, and they can then self-organize into a appropriate tissue. Wow. So this multi-skilled team at the lab have a couple of different techniques they're going to show me today. Bioprinting and something called microfluidics. Cell-sized plumbing, essentially. Wow. For controlling gradients of drugs or for immobilizing cells for certain experiments. It can also be for slightly larger things, like um, we do a lot of, uh, in biology, we use um, nematodes for some research. So it can be like tiny worms, things like that, or fruit flies. So like, I know you can 3D print a tool, be it like yeah. a spanner yeah. or something. This is making like micro, mini, nano tools. It's yeah. microfabrication. Yeah. Alban's team 3D print the tools needed to run these microfluidics experiments in their lab, including little plates that look like this. These are microfluidic systems. Let's have a go then. Let's <laughs> show me. Show me. <laughs> so first, let's try a microfluidic experiment. Yeah. So it's over there. Okay. Yeah. I'll follow you. As Christina mentioned, microfluidics is essentially mini plumbing. At its core, Alban's team need to create unique ways of directing teeny tiny quantities of fluid or gas to allow them to mix in certain super precise and replicable ratios. They do this using a see-through chip with engraved channels ranging from tens to hundreds of micrometers wide. And I love how pretty this intricate detail looks. So this is a dust-free bench. Okay. Where are you gonna perform the microfluidic experiment? I'm going to perform one. You're going to do oh, it. Oh, cool. Yes. So the chip is ready. The tubing is on the chip, but you're going to have to basically fill the syringe with the different two media. OK. OK, link them to the chip, and then you're going to flow liquid in it so you can mix properly the two different media. OK. OK. These microfluidic chips have applications in all sorts of areas of science, like controlling how much of each substance goes into a drug. This is due to the precise control over the ratios of each liquid or media that are filtered through the chip, which is thanks to the design of the channels, making sure that the liquid is mixed in just the right way. You can also use these chips to immobilize things like nematodes, as Christina mentioned earlier. Basically, liquids act a bit differently when channeled at this scale. This allows you to use the liquids to create tiny droplets, and you can trap whatever you need to observe inside those droplets. So for this microfluidic chip specifically, it's more for fun fundamental science, fundamental research, where we want to experiment specifically how cells are going to grow within a confined environment. Okay. And for that, we need to flow a, a specific type of media in the chip. Yeah. So this pre-chip is going to... So it's not directly like medicine or anything, it's the, the yeah. fundamentals of how it works exactly. kind of research. Exactly. Okay. Well, what do we do first? Uh, so first, you're going to... Take the syringe and mm -hmm. fill them with the media, one with the blue, one with the orange. Okay. 
<laughs> it's, a best, it's a bespoke okay. uh, syringe pump, so... And this is 3D printed as well, looking Yes. Yeah. So what, am I taking one of the orange? Yeah. This is the blue, you can take the blue that. What, and suck some of that up yes, in Yes, exactly. I've not really used syringes before, <laughs> have I? I bet you use them all the time. And then shove it in here again? Exactly. Oh, and this is going to let you squeeze both exactly. at the same time. And now I've squeezed blue stuff everywhere. That's fine, it's made for that. <laughs> and then get this one out. It's and physical then. work. That one? <laughs> no, the one next to it. This one? This one. This one? Yeah. <laughs> This fume cupboard's made for shorter people than me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a bit much in there. So now you're going to open the dishware. You can yeah. find the mat flitchy. Oh, um, so there are three tubing, OK? You have to put them on the um, okay. syringe. It doesn't matter which one's which, does it? No. OK, and then there's an output? Yes, this is to go there. OK, so that's where the output's going to go. Yeah. Way! Oh, that's great. So we're going to be able to see these two colours going through these two pipes. And I assume to do that, we twist this. Yes. And then that will push both syringes at the same speed. Exactly. Yeah. OK. Shall we do some science? Let's go ahead. Oh, wow, it does go really fast. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's amazing. So what's it doing here? Why does it need to go through all of these channels? So this specific chip is called a mixer. Yeah. So in every little channel, actually, it's creating movement in the fluid. So yeah. then you can mix properly um, the two media. And in the big chamber, you have a nice little gradient from blue to yellow um. that, that is completely steady. So by the time it goes out, so this means not only are you mixing the two things, it's a steady mix out of the other end. Exactly. So that rather than having to put two things together and stir it, yeah. that's doing the stirring for you. Yes. That's really cool. So that was made on a 3D printer. This one specifically, yeah, it's quite yeah. big. So yeah. we used the printer I showed you earlier. Yeah. Wow. And this is big. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm having to squint to see it. You can see it, so it's big. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. What's next? Uh, next, we're going to go to bioprinting. Bioprinting. Yes. Let's print some body parts. <laughs> Which way are we going? Over there. OK. Let's go. Is this, is this a handover? Yeah, we're going to go through to our uh, bioprinting lab. Ooh, so another room. Follow me. OK. Yeah. Uh, it does look very science in here, I'll tell you. Yeah. This is uh, where we have our bioprinting set up in this ooh, room. Ooh. So this is our bioprinter space. Cool. I can see the bio because the biohazard sign. Exactly. That's how you know. <laughs> also, the big hoods to stop anything getting in or anything getting out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have two bioprinters. So okay. this is an extrusion-based one, so yeah. similar to the FDM that you're familiar with. Yeah. I should probably define what that is for anyone who doesn't know as much about 3D printing as I do. FDM is one name for an extrusion-based printer like the one we were talking about earlier, where a substance is pushed out of a nozzle, kind of like a syringe, and layered up into the shape of your design. In my experience, that's always been plastic, but apparently in Christina's experience, it's actually human cells. The one in the corner there, that's a light-based one. So okay. similar, similar concept to the resin-based yeah. one. These SLA printers work a bit differently. They use light to set liquid resin in the shape of your design. But instead of resin, you're using biomaterials? Yeah, we're using materials that are biocompatible, so aren't going to kill cells. And the also the benefit of that one is um, even though it uses light, which is usually toxic to cells, it can use really low levels of light because of the materials they've developed to go with it. So you can actually print with cells already mixed in right. so that they are incorporated into your final 3D shape. That is so cool. And I've noticed that you've named all of your machines. Yes. Ludicrous Flamingo yes. is a ludicrous name for a 3D printer. It, just, it has all the bangs and whistles. I mean, you can see you can see there are four different types of, of heads attached. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like plug and play. We can have several different methods of using this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a fabulous, <laughs> fabulous over the top piece of equipment. So how this one works, this is what we're going to have a go on today. Okay. Um, how it works is it's extrusion based. So we have a little syringe of our material, which we yeah. put into one of the heads. We attach a nozzle on the bottom and that nozzle can be multiple different sizes depending on what you're printing. So it works the same like normal 
plastic 3D extrusion printers, you can get different nozzle sizes. Exactly. But that's got an extruder that pulls plastic through, whereas this is a syringe because it's liquidy. Yeah, stuff so and it's gels. a sort of um, soft gels, yeah. um, generally, sort of jelly like or a, yeah. a loose jelly. And uh, you can see there's the blue attachment on the top. So what that does is that applies the compressed air in a controlled manner, yeah. which pushes a little white plunger down inside the tube, and that's what causes the extrusion. Cool. So that's what we control. We control the pressure that's applied, mm. and also we can control the speed that it moves around the shape we've drawn. Yeah. Um, and we can control all that from our iPad. Cool. And as Someone's you can see, written my name. <laughs> we can um, draw whatever we want. So we can have more complex 3D files that we might yeah. make on other software and import, or we can just draw and print shapes or just write with the pen the names. Yeah. So for example, here I have written Mac Gray is trying. I just yeah. wrote this with the little pen uh, symbol. And uh, you've got Mac Gray in one color. That means it's going to come from head two which is the second one along, yeah. and that's going to be blue material. Is trying is in purple, that's coming from head four, which is going to be a red material. Yeah, and the gels, liquids that we're yeah. squirting out here, I assume those are just test subjects. Yeah, There's no are, these, actual bio no, there are, there are, <laughs> We're not uh, playing with the live cells at the moment. You're not going to waste these, that on me. <laughs> yeah, no, these are, just, these are just test materials for getting to grips and, and learning how to use the yeah. material, oh, the cool. printer particularly. So I assume this just has a print button on it. You go, go, and it yes, just does it. Yes, pretty much. So if we go along on next, so it's just here where we would set up all the um, the parameters, so the pressure, the print speed. I've already set that up for this. And it's just like a 3D printer showing what it's going to look like. Yeah. And any other settings. Ready to go. Go to print and start print. So does it need a specific type of surface for what it's extruding to stick to, or just any old dish? No, uh, it can print on anything. So um, it's choosing to do it in dots at the moment. Can it also do lines and stuff? It can, um, but not with the simplified way I drew that. Yeah. You can program it, because you can also access the G-code. Are you familiar with G-code? Yes, that's, that's, the, that's the control code yeah. that 3D printers and other um, computer-controlled machinery uses to say what to do. Yeah. And that's how all of the 3D models get converted into go left a bit, right a bit, up a bit, down a bit, right? Exactly. So yeah. this uses the exact same sort of system. Yeah. Um, so we can have a very simplified model where we just draw something and it, it'll figure it out. Yeah. But we can also go into the code and be much more precise about right. exactly how it moves for every structure. Um, and actually, you asked what surfaces we can print on. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a flat surface. If we have a 3D surface, um, we can, as long as we have a scan of that, we know what that surface is. Right. We can put that into the software and tell the G-code to print over on top of a 3D structure. So for example, one thing you might use this type of printer for is um, people getting um, facial reconstruction, nose reconstructions. Right. If they've had some damage to that, we can print cartilage um, in the shape that would fit their face. Yeah. And then we can print skin cells over the top of it. And that would actually go on their face? Yes. We're not quite there yet, but, but that's, that, where that's where the research the is going. Thing. That's the whole point yeah. of it, is the research. Yeah. So we can have like a picture or a scan of their face. Um, reconstruct 3D print a nose that matches what their nose should look 3D like. 3D print a nose? Yes. And ears. Ear nose and ears are kind of the easiest because they're mostly cartilage with a bit of skin. <laughs> Anything where you're trying to get lots of blood vessels in, those are a bit trickier. Right. That is so magical. So, like, there are so many concepts I've been told here, all these different things with the microfluidics yeah. in, the, in the other lab and this. So, day to day, you are squirting out gels into a shape. Yes. Those gels have cells inside them. Yes. And those cells, when they're in the body or in an animal, they like being in a specific shape. Yeah. And normally when you research with them, they will be on a flat uh, Petri dish or something. Yeah. But by doing this, you can put them in the shape they like being in, so you can see them in their more normal environment. Yeah. Is that that is, right. that is what the aim of the whole thing is to try and get them into a more natural state, a yeah. state that is more um, re, uh, reminiscent of what is actually in the body. 
What is tricky is we don't always know perfectly how cells are in the body or yeah. how they've got that way. Um, and the body is very good at making the cells be the shape we yeah. they need to be. Um, so we're trying to find ways to do some of that work. Yeah. But also, what do we need to give cells so that they will do the work themselves and they will self-organize into the shape that they want to be in? So to really get bioprinting to work, to, to get the most out of it, you need the printing knowledge, the biological question, and the biologists to yeah. actually ask the right questions and understand the answers you're getting. You need chemistry to create the materials that will replicate but that will be um, appealing to the cells and yes. what we're actually aiming for. But also those materials need to be printable, which... You, there are you know, so many different disciplines involved. Like this, yeah. this is the kind of thing, like if, if someone wanted to get involved into this kind of research, like that's partially why I share this, because it's yeah. so cool. Yeah. People won't even know it exists to have a go at it. Yeah. But if you want to do that, like, like if you're interested in any of the fields of science or engineering, because this is a machine, it's got motors and everything in yeah. it, you could end up in this completely. Yeah. I mean, my background, I studied biology, yeah. um, but now the rest of the lab, they're all engineers. Yeah. I'm working more with engineering principles. Yeah. Now with the bioprinting, I'm going a bit back in towards the biology stuff, but it's, yeah, th these are things I didn't know were options when I did my degree, yeah. but you can really... And they might not even have been options. That's no, the thing no, that they changes. they probably yeah. weren't, yeah. yeah. So you can, you're not, you're not committed to one discipline. Yeah from even up, you know, beyond undergrad, PhD, you can always find a new thing and branch into a new thing, yeah. which I think is great. That is amazing. Thank you so much for showing You're me all of this. Welcome. I can't <laughs> believe it exists to this level. I, I can't thank you enough for your time and You're very welcome. experience. Shall we have a look at your prints? Yeah. There you go. Oh, wow. Can I touch? Yes, you can touch. It's my name. So I've had my name written on a road before, and now I've got it written in biomaterial. What on earth can I get it written in next? <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. If you want to visit the Hello Brain exhibition at the Francis Crick Institute, it's on until the 7th of December 2024. Thanks once again to Incogni. For more info, click the link in the description for more.